Praise the Lord. Father, we thank you for tonight. We bless your name. We thank you for bringing us to the Bible study tonight. Thank you, Lord, because week after week, you teach us. You reveal your might and your truth unto us. Lord, we pray that even this day, you reveal the depths of the word of God to everyone in Jesus' name. Lord, we pray that this word will bear fruit in every heart. And a great mighty things will do through your word as we look at the word tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Bless your people, Lord. Amen. And bless other people through us as well. Amen. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Thank you very much. We can sit down. We come to the Bible study tonight. And we're going to continue the series we've been studying. We're looking at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Already we have looked at 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, till 8. Just to recap, that is just to tell you what we have done before. We have spoken about the day of the Lord. And that as we think about the day of the Lord, that day of the Lord actually means that there is going to be a time of suffering for this world. A time of punishment for the people that do not know the Lord. A time when the people have rejected the Lord. They will understand why the Lord had been giving them mercy, showing them mercy, but they rejected. And then that time will be a time of suffering and punishment and calamity. If you look at it again from verse 1, I'm looking at First Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 1. It says, But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you, for ye yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. I've explained that before. It says the day of the Lord. That day of the Lord will be the day of judgment. It's not talking of the day of the Lord like Sunday. Sometimes we say, day is the day of the Lord. I am going to the church service. This day of the Lord is not talking about that kind of day. It's talking about a period. You turn your Bible to Isaiah chapter 13. Isaiah chapter 13. And you'll see here the language of the day of the Lord. It says in verse 9 there, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. You learn something in that passage. It says, in the day of the Lord, and it's coming. And that means it wasn't there at that time. And that means that day of the Lord is not here yet. It is still coming. In verse 9 there it says, It's cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and then it shall destroy the sinners thereof. That means it's a day of punishment for the sinners. Come back to First Thessalonians chapter 5. It says in verse 2, it says, It shall come. And it will come like a thief in the night. Look at verse 3. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them. Now you understand when we say them, it means we're talking about the people who are not inside. We're saying them out there, them over there. If we are referring to ourselves, we we'll say us, we we'll say we. We believers, we children of God, us, the children of God, but they or them are outside. That's why it says it will come upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. They shall not escape. Look at the change now, the change of pronoun. That is the change from we to us, or from they to us. Look at verse 4. It says, but ye, brethren, and not in darkness, that that day should come, overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of life. It's not talking about the children of God, the children of light. You know that Jesus Christ is the light of the world. And when he says the children of light, those who have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, and they are the children of God. God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. You remember Jesus, light of the world, and God is light, and is, there's no darkness at all. So when it says children of light, it's talking about the children of God. Those who have repented of their sins, they are born again, they're children of God, and children of light. And the works of darkness, they have abandoned, they have rejected, and they're now living in the light, a life that is glorious, a life that is 
beautiful. Then it goes on. It says in verse 5, Ye are all the children of light, and the children of the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. In verse 6, Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. It's talking about us now, us apostles, us pastors, us evangelists, and us children of God, us members of the church. And then it goes on in verse 8. But let us who have the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and for an helmet, the hope of salvation. In that verse 8, I'm going to pick out some words there. It says... But let us, who are of the day, be sober, putting on the breastplate of the first word, faith, then the breastplate of love, and then the helmet of hope. Three words there, you have love, you have faith, you have hope. And aren't, are, they not, are they not the important words, essential words, that characterize the life of the believer? Look at First Corinthians chapter 13. We're looking at it in verse 13, 13, 13, 1 Corinthians. And now abided faith, hope, and charity. That's what charity means, love there. And it says these three, but well, the greatest of these is charity. It's talking about these Thessalonian believers. And it mentions faith, it mentions love, it mentions hope. Come to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. I'm reading there from verse 3. Remembering without ceasing your work of faith, that's one of the words, faith, and your labor of love, that's another one, love, and patience of hope, that's the third one, hope. It says we're remembering you because we know three things about you. One, we know about your faith. Two, we know about your love. And three, we know about your hope. Hope, faith, and love. And here he's telling us, come back now to First Thessalonians chapter 5. And I'm reading there from verse 8 again. But let us, who of the day, be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and from helmet, the hope of salvation. Now you see, it's been talking about the day of the Lord. Judgment is coming. Punishment is coming for the people of the world. And in those of us who are children of God, we're children of the light. And because we're children of light, he says, we're not going to be expecting those bad things to happen. That is at the end of time, when the judgment will come, we're going to escape that judgment. That leads me now to verse 9. He says, for God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Come on to verse 10. It says in verse 10, who died for us, that's Jesus Christ who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, whether we're still alive or we're dead, it says we should live together with him. Look at verse 11. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. As he tells us here that for God has not appointed us to wrath, the most solemn and sobering revelation in scripture is that though God has not appointed any man to wrath, a man will suffer divine wrath because there's a personal choice. There are people that choose to suffer. There are people that choose to forsake the Lord. There are people that reject mercy. And when we reject mercy, the only thing waiting for us will be the judgment of God. That's why it says over here, but after thine hardness and impenitent heart, treacherous up unto thyself, wrath against the day of wrath. The Lord has made his will known. The Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's in Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9. Yet, except ye repent, the Lord Jesus Christ said, Ye shall all likewise perish. The wrath referred to in First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9, is the wrath to come. The wrath shall come. And as a word, it's a big word. We call it eschatology. Eschatology is referring to the study of the things to come. Of the last days, we are talking about the rapture, then about the great tribulation, and then about the millennial reign of Christ, and about uh, eternity. And those studies referring to the things to come, we call them eschatology. Put it in an adjective form, eschatological. And so the wrath we are talking about is the wrath that is coming in the day of the Lord, and there is eternal wrath as well that will be forever and ever. 
these Thessalonian believers, there's something that happened to them. They heard the gospel. They repented of their sins. They turned to the Lord. And from that moment on, the Lord said, Now you escape the wrath to come. You remember the John the Baptist, when he was talking to the children of Israel, he said, Who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? You see, those prophets of old and those preachers of old and those people that God raised up, they knew that the wrath was coming. It was the wrath to come. And then it says, They fled from the wrath to come. Let's look at uh, the word of God in First Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10. First Thessalonians chapter 1, we're looking at verse 10. It says, And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Delivered us from the wrath to come. Today we're looking at this study under three perspectives. To start with, you can see that on your outline is a believer's destiny and escape from the future wrath believer's destiny. That is, we have a destiny, a place we're going, and we're going to be there forever. And it says uh, we have that destiny, and we're going to also spend eternity there. It's uh, talking then about this believer's destiny, and then the escape that we're going to have from future earth. I divide the message to three parts. Number one, you can see that on your outline, the blessedness of saints' preservation from eternal wrath. The blessedness, the wonder, or the fact that this is the provision the Lord has made that is going to preserve us, is going to keep us away, is going to protect us from eternal wrath. Number two, the basis of saving propitiation, propitiation through his eternal redemption. It, there is a saving redemption that is, it saves us. And because it saves us, then we're protected from that eternal wrath and eternal destruction. Number three, the bishopric. The bishopric, that word bishopric, I'll explain that uh, further later. When you say bishop and then bishopric, it's like we say overseer, overseership. Or we say you have a minister and then you have ministry. The bishopric, the office, the ministry of saved people through a divine relationship. Let's come back to number one. The blessedness of the saints' preservation from eternal wrath. Saints' preservation, not sinners' preservation. The sinners are not going to be preserved from eternal wrath. It's the saints, the people who are born again, the people who are children of God. Those are the people that are going to be preserved from eternal wrath. And I pray that you'll enjoy that preservation in Jesus' name. We're looking at first Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9. It says, For God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. It says God has not appointed us. When you talk of appointment, it's like here is something to do. And then you appoint an individual to do that thing. Here is something to carry. And then you appoint somebody to say, Mr. A, you are carrying this thing. Or you are saying that here is something to bear. And you are saying that it is this man or this woman that is bearing that thing. There is a wrath to come. And that wrath to come is like punishment. It's like heavy load and heavy weight. And the Lord is saying there are people that are appointed. They appoint themselves actually because they reject the salvation of the Lord and they reject the forgiveness of the Lord. Because of that rejection, they are appointed to bear, they are appointed to carry, they are appointed to have that punishment, the wrath to come. But it says for those of us who are born again, those of us who are children of God, and those of us who have visited Calvary by faith, and our sins are taken away, and we have peace of God in our heart, and we have the peace of mind, because Jesus Christ has forgiven us. He says, we are not appointed to that road to come, but we are appointed to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. We're coming back to that same chapter 1 that I read before. I'm reading now from chapter 1, verse 5. Chapter 1, verse 5, when it says, God has not appointed us, the us there, the believers. We Thessalonians, 
we Christians, we children of God, God has not appointed us to wrath. See what happened to them. And if you're going to enjoy this preservation from eternal wrath, this must happen to you too. If you're going to enjoy this privilege that you'll not be appointed unto the wrath to come, you're going to be like these Thessalonian believers. What do we know about them? Look at it from verse 5, chapter 1. For our gospel came not unto you in what only, but also in power. Number one, the gospel came unto them. And the gospel has come to you. What's the gospel? God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. What's the gospel? All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And we cannot save ourselves, but God so loved us that he sent Jesus Christ, that pure sacrifice and holy sacrifice to die for our sins and because he died for us we will not die again and whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved and the moment you call upon him believing on him then you are saved that is the gospel and it says it didn't come in words only there are people that have the gospel in their head they don't have it in the heart when it is in the head it came in word only but it came with power transforming their hearts and transforming their lives that's why it says if you go on in that verse five it says that's chapter one verse five and in the holy ghost and in much assurance, as she know what manner of men we were among you for your sakes. Look at verse 6. And ye became followers of us. And it says, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost. So that ye were examples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord. Not only in Macedonia and Achaia. But also, in every place, your faith to God's word is spread abroad, so that we need not speak anything. But they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we add unto you, how ye turned to God. God from idols to serve the living and true God. Can you see what happened to them? And that's what should happen to us. If we're going to escape the judgment to come, the wrath to come, if we're going to be preserved from that wrath to come, eternal wrath, it means that we have turned away from something and then we turn to someone. We turn away from, I said something. What did I say? Something? Idol. Idol is just like an object. Idol is something. But we turn away from that and then we turn to somebody. We turn to the Lord Jesus Christ and then we're saved. And then it says in verse 10, and to wait for his son from heaven. That is Jesus Christ. He went to heaven. And he's coming back. And when he comes back, he's going to take us home. And we're waiting for that Jesus, our Savior, our Lord, our Redeemer, the Son of God from heaven. And it says, to whom, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. And it's a salvation that does that for us. I'm looking at Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, I read from verse 8, verse 9, and verse 10. We're talking about the blessedness of the children of God. The blessedness of those who are saved, saved by grace. Their sins have been taken away, and the Spirit of God is bearing witness in your heart. Praise the Lord, I'm not just a church goer. I'm not just warming the bench every Sunday when I come. I have the peace of God within me. I have the transformation, the change of life. And because of that, I'm waiting for the coming of the Lord. He's coming for me and coming for you. We shall see him in Jesus' name. Amen. We're looking at Romans chapter 5 verse 8. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. When you read the Bible, you read the Bible intelligently. It says, while we were yet sinners, we were, because we are no more like that now. You know, the way some people talk about being Christian, they say, we were sinners, we are sinners, we will continue forever to be sinners. That's not right. If we're real children of God, we were sinners in the past, but today we're new creatures in Christ. And I pray that new life will be manifested in your life in Jesus' name. It says in verse 9, much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. That's what we are talking about. Because we are now justified. Because we are now forgiven. All our sins are taken away. It says we shall be saved. We shall be preserved. We shall be rescued from the wrath to come. It says in verse 10, for if while we were enemies, 
who are reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Let's look at uh, Second Peter chapter 3. And you see why the Lord himself is saying that he wants to redeem all. If you are not born again yet, this night you'll be born again in Jesus' name. And he's telling us right here that he's not willing that any of us should perish. He's not willing that any of us will go through that time of the great tribulation and then experience the wrath of God. Second Peter chapter 3 verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness, but is long suffering towards word, not willing that any should perish, not willing that you should perish, no matter who you are, a boy, a girl, a man, a woman, a father, a mother, or maybe you are just coming today for the first time here, and the Lord is saying, is not willing that you should perish, you will not perish. And I will not perish. That's the reason why we come here. That's why we're hearing the word of God. So that when the word of God comes, anything that will bring wrath to come, that will bring the judgment of God, we abandon them. We repent of them. And we say, Lord, here am I today. I want your salvation. And that salvation will be yours. It says that all should come to repentance how do we come to repentance it's just by you have the conviction of your sin that you've been doing this you've been doing this the pastor is not running after you or the wife of the pastor running after you or anybody running after you and saying well why are you doing this why are you doing no not at all just by yourself voluntarily that the spirit of god is bringing the word in your heart and you say yes i realize i've been a sinner this will have to stop and thank god jesus died for me on the cross of calvary and because he died for me i'm going to give my life to the lord jesus christ the moment you do that salvation will be yours and then you'll be able to say praise the lord i am born again and because i'm born again things will never be the same in my life again look at john chapter 3 John chapter 3, I read from verse 18. It says in verse 18, He that believeth on him is not condemned. Thank God that is me. He that believeth on him, I believe in the Lord. I said, I believe in the Lord. I gave my life. There was a day I had the gospel, just like you are hearing today. And then they made the altar call. And he said, if you're giving your life to the Lord, and you want to be born again, and you want to escape the judgment to come, where are you? And then I went to the front, I knelt down, and then I gave my life to the Lord. If you have not done that before, that is the most essential thing you ought to do. Not just coming to church. It's good to come to church. It's like somebody going to school. It's good to go to school. But you must have what the teacher is teaching. It's when you possess that, you're a real student. And when I came forward, I gave my life. Things totally changed. That all these pranks I've played before, the bad things I've been before, everything vanished away. I believe that if you are born again, that has happened to you already. If it has not happened tonight, it's your night. I said tonight is your night. You'll have it in Jesus' name. It says in that verse 18, He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Look at verse 36. He that believeth on the Son has everlasting life. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but, look at this word, the wrath of God abideth on him. He that believeth not, the wrath of God abideth on him. But it's by repentance we escape that wrath of God. Matthew chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 7. Matthew chapter 3, I appreciate you opening your Bible. Matthew chapter 3, we're looking at verse 7. In Matthew chapter 3 verse 7, here is what he tells us. It says, But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? O generation of 
vipers who has warned you to flee from the rust to come. You see, John the Baptist lived in the wilderness. That he is not in the community like this, like you are living. He lived far away. And in the wilderness, you have some bush over there. And whenever you make fire, and uh, you put the fire there, the snakes, those are the vipers, they'll be running very quickly out of that bush because it's caught fire. And then John the Baptist was using that same illustration. He said, there's a time that the bush of this world, the whole world, will be on fire. And then he's saying, it will be too late at that time for those snakes, generation of vipers, to run out of that fire. He's saying that now before that fire is lit, is kindled, and before that fire begins to burn, this is the time to run away and to escape. That's why when he saw them, he said, generation of vipers. You know vipers, vipers, snakes. They will be just sliding like that, gliding on. Very quietly, they do what they do. There's some quiet sinners. There's some silent sinners. They don't make too much noise. And they don't say they stop too much. And they do what they do. And it's evil. And nobody even knows. A snake might be somewhere you don't know anything. is happening until you begin to kindle the fire. And then the snake is running out. That's why he's talking to these people. And he's talking to you and talking to every one of us. In the same generation of vipers. Those who are quietly living in sin quietly or silently or secretly they're living in sin this is the time to escape that rust to come bring forth therefore fruit meat for repentance it says that if we say we're christians we must bring forth the fruit the evidence and the proof that we have actually repented look at verse 9 it says and think not to say within yourselves we have abraham to our father some of our young people maybe you are there today a young man a young woman and you are born in the church and because your parents were christians your parents were christians before you were born and you say immediately i was born. i just opened my eyes like this i found myself in church and he said don't you ever say we have abraham to our father and because we have Abraham to our father, that means we can do anything, we can say anything, and we can live anyhow. That is not because of who your dad is or who your mom is, who your parents are. It is because you're a real child of God. Salvation is personal. And eternal life is personal. Repentance is personal. Daddy cannot eat for you. You have to eat your own food. And daddy cannot drink water for you. You have to drink your own water. And daddy cannot have salvation for you. Well, are you born again? My daddy already is born again. Isn't that enough? Are you saved? My mommy is saved already. Is that not enough? The Lord is telling us that salvation is personal. You must have your own salvation. I must have my own salvation. Just like I cannot eat for you. I'm your pastor. I cannot eat for you. I cannot drink water for you when you are thirsty. I cannot breathe for you. I do my own breathing. You do your own breathing. The same thing. Salvation. You need to have your own salvation. I need to have my own salvation. That's why it says, don't you ever say, I have Abraham as my father. It says, for I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that bringeth forth not good fruit is cut down, is hewn down, and cast into the fire. That's the rust to come. Cast into the fire. And I pray that that will not be your Lord in Jesus' name. I'm looking at Luke chapter 21. After you come to the Lord, now you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. There is something you ought to know. That you keep in that salvation. You remain in that salvation. And it is remaining in that salvation until it comes. That's what will preserve you from that wrath to come. I'm looking at Luke chapter 21. I'm reading from verse 34. Luke chapter 21 verse 34. And take heed to yourselves. Lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and cares of this life, so that day come upon you unawares. Remember what we were studying? We were studying about the day of the Lord and the wrath that comes at the day of the Lord. It says, You must take heed to yourself. Now you are born again, you are a child of God, you remain in that salvation. It is remaining in that salvation that preserves you from that wrath to come. Look at verse 35. For as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the earth. Watch ye therefore. Watch ye therefore. You are born again. Watch ye therefore. 
That salvation is a treasure. Watch it therefore. You are born again. That salvation is a great sin, a great possession. Watch over it because there is a thief, a devil that wants to snatch it away from you. Watch it therefore and pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. The believers referred to as us in the passage we read have not been appointed unto us. We are not appointed to wrath of the great tribulation. He's telling us that that wrath is coming in the day of the Lord. God's wrath is reserved for his enemies, not for his children. The wrath of the Lamb is not for the bride of the Lamb, but for the adversaries of the Lamb. The wrath of God will be poured out on the unbelieving world without mixture and without mercy during the great tribulation and day the sinner shall not escape but we who are the children of god the saints of god the servants of god those who have been saved and cleansed and washed in the blood of the lamb purified by christ's blood will escape all the sin that shall come to pass and i pray that you will be among the number in jesus name that's why we sing when the saints go Matching it by the grace of God, you'll be matching with us in Jesus' name. Amen. That wrath to come, as I've told you before, refers to eternal wrath. That means that at the end of time, it is uh, this wrath that's associated with the great tribulation, associated also with the eternal wrath, the unquenchable fire, eternal indignation, and wrath, and tribulation, and anguish. The wrath the torment, the fire, the brimstone that is forever and ever. The blessed truth that gladdens the believer's heart is the reassurance that he is saved and that he'll be delivered from this eternal wrath and punishment and indignation and suffering and torment. The privilege of escape. The possibility of deliverance is available for everyone through obtaining salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. The promise of this salvation is unto you and to all the sinners and backsliders. All you need is to repent or turn away from all your sins and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved as you abide in him living in obedience to the word of the Lord by his grace, and you are waiting for the coming of the Lord, that trust to come will not catch up with you in Jesus' name. Amen. We come to point number two now, the basis of saving propitiation through his eternal redemption. As you look at your outline, you see that big word there, propitiation, propitiation. Where did we get that word? Let me read this to you. We're looking at Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, I want you to mark this word in your Bible. It's very important. The basis of saving propitiation through his eternal redemption. Chapter 3 of Romans. And I'm reading there from verse 25. Chapter 3, verse 25. It says in verse 25, Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. That's the word there. What's appeasement? When you have offended somebody, the fellow is angry. And he's saying, I'm going to deal with you. And then you begin to plead and beg to appease him. To tell, I'm sorry about what I've done. And then when he is a kind of appeased, we call that appeasement. We call that conciliation. Or we call that atonement. That is, the fellow now is happy with you. He says, I'm not angry at you anymore. Everything is over now. It's like, now we have fellowship. We have relationship. And that's what Jesus Christ came to do for us. Jesus Christ actually became a bridge between us and God. Here is God is holy is pure and his purity and holiness is dazzling it could be terrifying and here we are on the other side as sinners and to join a sinner and reconcile him to the holy god that's very difficult and then jesus comes in between he stretches the hand to god because he is god as well and then he stretches the hand to man because he is man as well he's the only one that is god on the one side and he's also man and because of that he can join the hand of sinful man to the hand of the holy God. And it becomes the bridge. It becomes the source of our salvation. It becomes the appeasement, the atonement for us. I'm going to read the whole thing now. In Romans chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 23. Romans chapter 3, verse 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All have sinned, everybody. 
It says when you are born into this world, you are born a sinner. You are not born a saint. Born a sinner. And then it says it's everybody. Then it says in verse 24, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth. Whom God has set forth. Do you understand that language? It's like the Father in heaven. It says, who wants salvation? Then you raise up your hand. Who wants forgiveness? You raise up your hand. And he says, who wants redemption? So that there will be no wrath, there will be no anger, there will be no judgment, there will be no punishment. Everything you ever did since you were born, the Lord says, who wants total forgiveness? And he'll say, I'm here. I want that forgiveness. Then he sets up Jesus Christ. And he says, everybody look at him. He is the only one I set down for the salvation of the whole of humanity. You may hear some other names that say, this one is prophet so-and-so, this one is a founder so-and-so, this one is this one. God said, all those ones have not set them up. This is the one I set up for your salvation. That's why we're talking about the basis, the foundation of saving propitiation, atonement, appeasement through his eternal redemption. Look at that verse 25 again. Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation, an appeasement, an atonement, a conciliation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission. That means the removal of the cleansing of the forgiveness of sins that are passed through the forgiveness of God to declare, I say, at this time, his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of him that believeth in Jesus. That's how that salvation comes. Let's look at First Thessalonians chapter 5 again. First Thessalonians chapter 5. I'm going to read from verse 9 and verse 10. I want you to see the link between those two verses of scripture. We're looking at um, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9. For God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. The salvation, the forgiveness, the redemption, the freedom, and the, the escape from the judgment to come is by our Lord Jesus Christ. Look at verse 10. Who died for us. Who died for us. He died for me. I said he died for me. He said he died for us that whether we are alive or we are dead, we wake or we sleep, we should live together with him. He is the basis of our salvation. There's no other name given among men whereby we must be saved except through the name of the Lord Jesus Christ because of the sacrifice that he made for us. In First Peter chapter 2, verse 24. First Peter chapter 2, verse 24. Who is his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. Who is own self, his own self. What does that mean? He didn't send an angel to take our sins away. He didn't send a religious leader to take our sins away. He didn't send mom or dad to take our sins away. We need to emphasize that because there are some people that put their salvation in somebody else. They say it's prophet so and so that will once he you know washes them with water or does whatever it is for them, all their sins are gone. Or they say it's a prayer warrior somewhere, it's an intercessor somewhere, or it's an evangelist somewhere. And once he does whatever he wants to do on their behalf, then they are saved. And the word of God is saying no, that he himself, that is Jesus Christ, he took our sins away. He bought them in his body on the tree. And then he says that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness by whose stripes ye were healed. I pray that that will be ours in Jesus name. I want you to look at First John chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 1. First John chapter 2. And we're reading from verse 1. My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. My little children, my little children. How does somebody become a child? Because it says, my little children. When the mother is pregnant and the child has not come out yet. And we say, how many children do you have? The mother is not going to count one two three four inside me 
never. He will not count the one inside until that child is born. You know, sometimes we say, how many members do we have in the church? We say, one, two, three, four, and we count everybody. I say, uh-uh, don't count everybody. We're talking about those who are born already. They are out of darkness. They are out of their sins. And the people who have been born again, those are the children of God. My little children, who are those little children? Their sins have been forgiven. They have been born again. Their lives are totally different. It is that new birth that makes us the children of God. My little children, these things I write unto you that ye sin not. When we are born again, things are different now. Amen. I said things are different now. Amen. The tobacco we used to chew, we don't chew that anymore. And the cigarette we used to smoke, we don't smoke that anymore. And what they call it now, cannabis or marijuana, whatever, all those drugs we used to take, we don't take them anymore. And the fighting we used to do on the streets, we don't do that anymore. We don't even fight inside the house, not to talk about fighting on the street. All those bad, bad things and the lies we used to tell, we don't tell that anymore. Or do we still do that? I said, do we still do that? The answer should be no if we are born again. Because that new birth changes everything. You know, sometimes you can be careless. We shouldn't be careless, but what if you are careless? Look at that verse 1. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he is a propitiation. That's the word again. Is the appeasement. He is the atonement or the propitiation or he is the appeasement for our sins. And it says, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. And I pray that that will be yours in Jesus' name. Amen. We're looking at Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 11. Here he tells us that for the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men. And then he tells us, teaching us that denying all ungodliness and worldly laws, we should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world. Now we live righteously and we live godly in this present world. In verse 13, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from a few iniquities. From what? All iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. And when that has happened to us, that's what we call salvation. And that is the basis of our escaping the wrath to come. The Bible says, all have sinned. And we have come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. That's the testimony of Scripture. And it says the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Except the Lord Jesus Christ, the holy, the righteous, the sinless, spotless Son of God had died for us. No one could have escaped the wrath of God. Only through salvation in Christ can anyone escape the wrath to come. He had no sin. We were the sinners. He died not for any sin that he had committed. He died to bear the punishment of our sins. He was not guilty of any offense against God or against man. We were the guilty people and we were the condemned people. The wrath and the judgment he bore and that he suffered to the full on the cross was for us, for all men. No good works of ours can atone for any of our past sins. Could we live a perfect life, an angelic life, a sinless life, even after, even after today? That alone cannot save us. All that we have done in the past, we must still pay for. We need a Savior who never sinned in thought or in act. We need a Savior who never sinned from birth till death. We need a Savior who never sinned before God, before man, or before Satan. We need a Savior who was perfect, a perfect Savior a sinless substitute, a holy sacrifice, a spotless lamb, the only one who meets this need and the only one who satisfied this requirement or demand is the only one who measures up to the demand of God and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Since the world began, there has not been anybody exactly like Jesus Christ. That's why we're told in Acts of the Apostles, you need to mark this in your Bible, open it and mark it. Acts of the Apostles chapter 4. 
and I'm reading it from verse 12. Acts of the Apostles chapter 4, nobody like Jesus, and there's no other Savior, and there's no other Redeemer, and there's no other one that can make appeasement between us and the Almighty God. He is the only one, the only Savior. Acts of the Apostles chapter 4, I'm reading verse 12. Here's what it says. It says, neither is there salvation in any other. That's very clear. There's no salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. I come to point number three now. We're talking about this, and it is the bishopric of saved people through a defined relationship. And let me clear up that word to start with. We're looking at Acts of the Apostles chapter 1. Acts of the Apostles chapter 1, you're wondering, where does such a word come from? I've had a bishop. I've never had a bishopric. Where have we got that? Acts of the Apostles chapter 1, I'm reading there from verse 20. For it is written in the book of Psalms, let his habitation be desolate, and let no man dwell therein. And his bishop break, let another take. That's the word right there. His bishop break, let another take. What does that mean? That means his ministry. That means his overseership. That means his office. That means his service. Let another take. And as we look at this point number three, the bishop break of saved people. If I substitute those words I've just read to you now, so your outline, line one or line two there, it means his overseership. It means his office. It means his service. And it means his ministry. Every believer that is every saved person has a ministry toward all the believers and toward unbelievers. That means when you are born again, when you are a child of God, you have a ministry. You have an office. You have something that the Lord expects you to do. Number one, you are shining as light in the world where you are. Not only that, number two, you are salt. It says you are the salt of the earth. And then the Lord Jesus Christ calls us a number of names. It says you are my witnesses. You will be a witness in Jesus' name. He even says we are watchmen. And because we are watchmen, we have something we're doing. We're doing that for the body of Christ. We're doing that for the church of the living God. And we're doing that for the people who are seeing the world, we need to bring them into the gospel. I'm coming to First Thessalonians chapter 5. First Thessalonians chapter 5, and I'm reading there from verse 11. First Thessalonians chapter 5, we're looking at verse 11. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. And what he's saying there is you comfort other people. Is somebody sick there? You comfort them. Is somebody going through some deep water, some problems there, and is getting discouraged? I don't know whether I want to come to church next Sunday or not. You go to them, or you call them on the phone, or you text them, or you send whatever message, email, and then you comfort them. It says we comfort one another. And then it says you edify, you build up, you encourage, and you lead people up when they're going through some challenges. Don't wait for other people to do that to you. Do that to them. That's what we're supposed to do. That's the ministry of saved people through a defined relationship. That is the relationships that we have to edify one another. And look at what Jesus Christ himself said. He tells us in John chapter 13, John chapter 13, that this is our responsibility, comforting one another, encouraging one another, building one another up, and lifting up one another, and admonishing one another, teaching one another, and uh, counseling one another too. In John chapter 13, I'm reading from verse 34, a new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another, as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have loved one to another. When you love somebody, you know, somebody says, he loves me, she loves me. You feel comforted, and you feel that you are not alone. You see, many of us are suffering from what we call loneliness. And we're lonely because there's nobody to talk to us. There's nobody to encourage us. And when you are going through some problems, it's like you have the problems all alone by yourself. And you are carrying a heavy load all alone by yourself. Somebody comes along you and then he comforts you, encourages you, advises you, and quotes the promises of God. 
God to you. And it says, don't worry. There's nothing to worry about. God is going to solve the problem. And then that cheers you up. You say, thank you very much. That encourages me. That's what we are to be doing to one another. And that is the evidence of the love. We're looking at Romans chapter 15, verse 14. Romans chapter 15. We're looking at verse 14. Here it says in chapter 15, verse 14. And I myself also am persuaded of you, my brethren, that ye also are full of goodness. We are full of goodness. Amen. I said we are full of goodness. Amen. Filled with all knowledge. Able also to admonish one another. Able also to encourage one another. Instruct one another. Teach one another. In Galatians chapter 5 verse 13. Galatians chapter 5. We are reading from verse 13. For brethren... Ye have been called to liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. By love serve one another. Admonish one another. Advise one another. Instruct one another. Encourage one another. Serve one another. Love one another. That's what the Lord is calling us to do. And we do that with the instruction of the word of God. Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, I'm reading there from verse 16 and verse 17. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Let the words of Christ dwell in you richly. How do we know that the word of God is dwelling in somebody richly? It's like somebody has been coming to church for how many years now? Maybe you are there, you've been coming for five years. You have been coming for seven years. You have been coming for nine years. And he over there has been coming for 15 years. And it's like somebody that has been visiting the well, you know, in a, you know, many of our villages and many of our local government areas and many of our places where what we call the well. Then you take a bucket and then you take it to the side of the well and then you come back. I'm saying, where is the water you brought back? Well, I didn't bring any water back. And then he goes again and goes again. He's been going for five years. And I look at his bucket. There's no drop of water in his bucket. And then another person, you know, he goes to the side of the well. He's just come for only two weeks. And he's put that bucket inside the well. And he's got some water. And I say, where's the evidence that you went to the well? He says, look at my bucket is full. If you push that person a little, what splashes out will be water. Clean water. Water. The other fellow, when you push him a little, his bucket is just making noise. The noise of singing, the noise of shouting, and the noise of praying. And they tell us that empty barrels make the loudest noise. I hope you are not empty. I said, I pray you'll not be empty. Amen. Many people come to church and they bring the bucket of their heart. And they bring it to the well of salvation. And they never dip that bucket of their heart into the well of salvation. And when they come out, they come to the well. They go back home the same as they came. It shouldn't be like that. We should be able to have that salvation that we know that something has happened. Because now we are filled with the word of God. We are filled with the encouragement and the love. So that the thing that is coming out of us will be what is free and heart. That's why it says, let the word of Christ dwelling you richly in all wisdom teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs singing with grace singing with what singing with grace in your heart to the lord and it says and whatsoever ye do in word or in deed do all in the name of the lord jesus giving thanks to god and the father by him this year, we have been emphasizing what we call dawn. That dawn is D-A-W-N. D-A-W-N. And we say that day, starting from this, 2011, we are saying it is the decade of dawn. That means discipling a whole nation. And that's what the Lord is telling us here, that if all of us in the Bible study, and all the people who are hearing me in any other place, all of us together, we say this is the decade of dawn. And it is not just for one local church here, it is for all the churches and all the believers discipling a whole nation. And I'm asking myself, how will that happen? Write this down. D-A-W-N. Developing all witnesses nationally. 
developing all witnesses nationally. We are all witnesses. The Lord has called us to be witnesses. We're looking at Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 43. And I'm reading there from verse 10. Isaiah chapter 43. We're looking at verse 10. Ye are my witnesses, says the Lord. Ye are my witnesses, says the Lord. As you are here for the Bible study today. And this, uh, we've been emphasizing this now. We emphasize it in January. Now we're in February. And we're still emphasizing this that in all the local governments, in all the regions, in all the states, and in all the countries, anywhere we are, that this done is what we are to really emphasize to and praise the Lord. You know, I've been reading the reports coming from some of our state of us, yes, and all the people, and I say, we praise the Lord, we planted this church here, we planted this church, we planted that church here. That's exactly what the Lord wants us to do, so that we will understand that we are developing all witnesses nationally, and in our nation here, that's what we need to do. In all the other countries where we have in the Bible, so that's what we ought to do, that we are developing all witnesses nationally. Witnesses, you'll be a witness. Amen. I will be a witness. Amen. And we who are pastors and we who are overseers, this is what you do. This is not the day of just uh, doing it all alone by ourselves. That's why I said, I think December last year, 2010, in the Bible, I said, it's no more video crusade. That you are now the video. You are now to take the word of God everywhere you are. You are a witness. I'm a witness. And he is a witness. And she is a witness. And all of us joining hands together. Together, we're going to be witnesses. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1, verse 8. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and to the uttermost part of the earth. We who are pastors and leaders and teachers and the church of the living God, we know what the Lord is calling us to. He wants us to develop all the members to be witnesses. And whether we're in the choir, we're among the ushers, we're in the security, or we're among those who are leading us fellowship or Zuna leaders or coordinators, anything we're doing, we're witnesses and done. is the decade in which we are now, which is developing all witnesses nationally. Let's look at Acts of the Apostles chapter 5 verse 32. Acts chapter 5, verse 32. We're doing it all together. We're encouraging one another. We're exhorting one another. We're admonishing one another. We're evangelizing the people of the world. And leaders ought to develop the witnesses nationally. We're looking at Acts chapter 5, verse 32. It says, and we are his witnesses. And we are his witnesses. Wouldn't it be wonderful if all the members of the church, all the members of every local church, will say, yes, we. We are his witnesses of these things. And so is the Holy Ghost, whom God has given to them that obey him, will be witnesses in Jesus' name. Amen. That means then we have a ministry. And this ministry, the ministry of every believer, every saved person, will be having a ministry toward other believers and toward the unbelievers as well. Every child of God has a God-given ministry, a God-given service to render both to saints in the Lord and sinners in the world. We are not only sons and daughters of God, we are witnesses, we are servants, and we are laborers together with him in view of eternity and in the light of what is coming upon this world, we persuade men and we plead with men and to be reconciled unto God because of the nearness and the imminence of the wrath to come, we sound the alarm. And then we blow the trumpet. We are warning the world and launch us to flee from the wrath to come. We preach to all. We want the careless. We want the negligent. We alert and arouse the deceived and all that sleep in false security. We instruct those who oppose themselves, those who hold the truth in unrighteousness, all who are striving hard to shut the door of heaven, the door of grace against themselves, we are warning them or we are pleading with them, be ye reconciled unto God. Because of the urgency of this critical hour, we preach, we plead, we warn, we exhort, 
we instruct, we admonish, we teach, we intercede, we cry aloud, and we spare not. We lift up the voice like a trumpet, and we're saying, come to the Lord. And we're also planting churches. That's the reason why we're having this project and this program of saturation church planting. At this time, in every region, every state, and every group of districts, and every district, and we're multiplying the churches so that we can carry out this uh, project of dawn. And how is this going to be done eventually when we talk about saturating? You saturate the whole country with churches. I write this now again, dawn, D-A-W-N, distributing appointed watchmen nationwide. Distributing. That means that we're not just having the church in one local area. You know, sometimes it's like uh, you have a bottle of salt and then you have um, you know, uh, you need to take your meal and then you pour the whole salt in just one plate of food and all the other plates that you know we're eating from, there's no salt there. We say, no, this is not right. We distribute. We distribute appointed watchmen nationwide. The Lord told Ezekiel that the Lord is telling you that he has appointed you, has appointed me to be watchmen. We're looking at Ezekiel chapter 3 and we're reading there from verse 17. Ezekiel chapter 3 verse 17. It says, Son of man, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore hear the word at my mouth and give them warning from me. And you are a witness and you are a watchman. And all of us who are here, you are born again, you are a child of God, you are a brother, you are a sister. It says we are watchmen and we need to distribute ourselves. That's why we have told ourselves that in every district, every community, we are going to survey all those places and they will say there's no church there. There ought to be one there. There ought to be one there. There ought to be one there. We distribute. How are we doing that? Let me just show you, you know, a very simple thing. Let's say, for example, a particular community is one million in population. And we're saying that we need one church in a population of at least 10,000. Let's say 10,000 here, one church, 10,000 here, one church. When you divide 1 million by 10,000, you have 100. That means in a population of 1 million people, we need 100 churches there, distributed evenly in those places. How about if you have 2 million population, that means you have 200 churches distributed evenly. That is what gives meaning and reality. That is what brings real strategy onto what we call the decade of done distributing appointed watchmen nationwide we're going to do it Amen. and when we do it there'll be church in every locality and then we don't have to travel a long distance to be able to get to a church as we round up i'm looking at the word of god here as to what we need to do we're looking at malachi chapter 3 i'm reading from verse 16 malachi chapter 3 i'm reading from verse 16 to verse 18 malachi chapter 3 Reading from verse 16. Then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another, and the Lord hearkened and heard it. They that fear the Lord, they that love the Lord, they who have been reconciled unto God. It says they spoke to one another every time, and the Lord hearkened and heard it, and a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. As we are carrying on this saturation church planting, and you get involved, the Lord is saying, he knows you, he knows your name, he knows the time you are spending, he knows all the effort that you are given, and then he writes a book of remembrance concerning you. You will not miss your reward in Jesus' name. And they shall be mine, says the Lord of all in that day when I make up my jewels and I will spare them as his man spareth his own son that serveth him then shall ye return and discern between the righteous and the wicked between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not I will serve the Lord and as we serve the Lord, we admonish one another, love one another, encourage one another, build up one another, edify one another, comfort one another. And the Lord is saying, great will be our reward in heaven in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's come back to First Thessalonians as we round up the Bible study tonight. We're looking at First Thessalonians chapter 5 from verse 9. For God has not appointed us unto wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us. He died for you. 
And I pray that the benefit of his death for you, you realize in Jesus' name. Amen. That means then you are born again. So that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify, build up, lift up, encourage one another, even as also ye do. You will do it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're not going to just be hearers of the word only. We're going to be doers of the word. Will you be doers of the word? Let's rise up and ask for grace in our hearts, grace in our lives. And talk to the Lord and say, Lord, I thank you for what I've heard. The believer's destiny and escape from future earth. Believer's destiny and escape from future earth. This is the time of to pray. If you have not been born again, set you with the Lord and say, Lord, I want to have real forgiveness of all my sins. I want to be a real child of God. Lord, I want to have the assurance my sins are taken away and born again. If any man be in Christ, a new creature, old things are passed away, all things have become new. Flee from the wrath to come. There's going to be judgment at the end of this life. And it's only those who know Jesus Christ as their Lord. And all their sins have been forgiven. They are not like vipers that are sinning, doing evil in the secret. They've come out of darkness. They've come into the light. And the Spirit of God is bearing witness with their hearts. They are chil they're children of God. They are no more sinners. They are saints. They are no more believers. They are believers. They are no more ungodly or righteous. They are godly. They are righteous. They have the evidence that Christ lives on the inside of them. Those are the people that when that day of the Lord, that day of wrath and that day of indignation will come, they will not go through that period of the great tribulation. They will not experience the wrath, the judgment that is coming upon the world of unbelievers because they are believed. You give your life to the Lord. Say, Lord, here am I. Lord, here am I. Lord, here am I. I don't want to be a secret sinner, a viper, a snake, biting people from behind. By biting, I want to be righteous, cleansed, washed, purged, purified by the blood of the Lamb. This is the day of salvation, it's the day of mercy, and whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Don't wait too late, the opportunity is there today. God is angry with the wicked every day. Let that grace come. Let that salvation come. Let that new life come. And you will never be the same again. <laughs>